So many of you this morning, thank you so much for joining. We're gonna get started here in just about a minute. We are waiting for a couple of more speakers that we're gonna have join us today. I'm saying hi to Lori, just thanks for coming on. <laughs> Oh, Took me for happy to be here. <laughs> Great to see everyone's faces this morning. Great. We're just waiting for one more speaker. Oh, so wonderful. Oh, I love seeing all these faces and names who are joining. Here comes Kira Topaski, one of our last speakers. Great. Um, so just for our IT folks, some of the speakers are in the last screen. You might have to find them. Uh, Scott Baracco is on, fantastic. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to see everyone today. Um, welcome to Compassion and Choices virtual event remembering and honoring love, held in commemoration with Valentine's Day and our effort to pass New York's Medical Aid and Dying Act. The campaign to pass this bill has long focused on love and compassion, and today we'll be honoring just that. We've invited some of our supporters to join with us today virtually to remember and honor those that they have loved and lost. As we take time to remember them, Speakers on today's call will also share ways that all of you can raise your voices and help expand options for those who are dying in the Empire State. For those of you who may be new to our campaign, passage of New York's Medical Aid and Dying Act would make New York the 10th state to give terminally ill adults a full range of end of life care options. Faced with a terminal diagnosis, New Yorkers deserve this full range of options for care at the end of life, which must include the option of medical aid in dying. Medical aid in dying would allow a qualified terminally ill adult to get a prescription from their doctor that they can take to bring about a peaceful death should suffering become too great at the end of life. How today's event is going to work is that we're gonna have a number of uh, speakers join us. And uh, if all of you will look to the bottom of your screen, there is what's called a chat box. Um, and in that chat box, if you click on it, you can see a running dialogue um, with information about New York's Medical Aid and Dying Act, uh, right now, I'm not seeing that. What I am seeing is some, some strangeness on the screen. Uh, I hope our IT people are, there we go. Okay, so on the chat box, you can ask questions of any one of our speakers. You can ask questions of our campaign staff. You can say hello to people. I'm gonna say hello to all of you right now in the chat box. Um, so you can see that here, hopefully. So you can use this to ask questions. Sometimes you mistype those questions and then you can just correct yourself. <laughs> um, if you hear something that you want to express support for, whether it's applause or, um, you know, if you want to show someone love, there's a reactions button at the bottom here. You can put a little heart, you can uh, put a little thumbs up, you can put an applause or you can use Jazz hands, which uh, is commonly used in the in the uh, in the deaf community, and it's also used um, across the Zoom platform. So if you hear something you like and you want to express support, you can use jazz hands or a reaction. Um, I hope that Amanda, have we got Reverend McNeil on? I see a phone number, so I'm not. I don't want to say that we haven't, because that could be him. Um, Reverend McNeil, are you on? 
No, I don't see him, Corinne, but I do know that um, the assembly member is here if you want to begin with her. Okay. As you put me on that side, Amanda. I think everyone froze for a second, but we should be <laughs> back. I think we maybe lost Corinne, Amanda. Okay. Um, can Patrick, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, so I am going to turn it over to assembly member Gonzalez Rojas. Um, she's a part of a very exciting class of new lawmakers elected to the New York State Assembly in 2020. And she represents the 34th assembly district, which includes the diverse Queens community of Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Woodside and Corona. She describes herself as an unapologetic social justice leader fighting for the values of dignity, justice and equity. And no apologies are necessary, particularly when with compassion and choices and our supporters. I'm delighted that we have assembly member Gonzalez Rojas support and to have her join us today. Assembly member. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for your important work. I'm really excited to be here today to support the Medical Aid and Dying Act. Um, this is an act of love. Um, I spent my career working on health, dignity and justice um, for all communities and the last 13 years in the reproductive justice space. And what's really centered in the reproductive justice space is to ensure that people have autonomy over their bodies and their decisions and the way they create families and raise the families that they wish to create. So I see a lot of alignment in this work. If you think about what the Medical Aid and Dying Act does is ensure dignity for people at the end of their life. It is something that is supported across New York State. We have 63% of folks upstate, 64% of folks downstate. The polls show that people of all faiths, all demographics, all political leanings, women, men, all races, that this is something that's supported across the board. And we need to pass this now. Now more than ever during this moment, we need to ensure dignity um, for all folks at the end of their life. There are 12 safeguards that are in place to present any concerns around coercion. And we know this is something that our communities need. I wanna especially thank the assembly sponsor, um, Amy Pollan, Assemblywoman Amy Pollan for her leadership. Um, I see this as a, a social justice issue, as a human rights issue, as an issue related to dignity, equity, and justice. Um, so I'm so grateful for all your work. Um, we need to pass this now. Um, and I'm excited to be a champion on this bill. So thank you. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you so much, Assemblymember. We are so grateful to have you with us today and to have your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to turn it over to Reverend Charles McNeil, who is the pastor of Unity Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., he also serves as the president of the National Capital Baptist Convention, which serves over a hundred churches in Washington, DC, the metro and the metro area. Reverend McNeil serves as a member of Compassion and Choices African American Leadership Council and uses every imaginable opportunity to raise awareness about tools to empower African Americans around end of life medical decision making. We are so thankful to have you today, Reverend McNeil. Ah, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. And uh, thank you for that introduction. I must uh, uh, let uh, Wendy and, and Don and all of them know that uh, you gave me a great introduction. So if I could use you on Sunday uh, to introduce you before I preach would be great. Uh, as stated, my name is Reverend Charles Winston McNeil Jr. And I pastor the Unity Baptist Church uh, in Washington, D.C. 
and I am a member of the uh, Compassion and Choices African American Leadership Council uh, for the past few years now. And as part of my work with this organization, uh, I have helped pass the uh, medical aid and dying legislation here uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. But before I did that, I was not uh, uh, always a supporter of medical dying, uh, aid and dying. Uh, but it wasn't until I uh, learned the details about the bill that I discovered how much of a compassionate option it would be for those who were suffering. Uh, in terms of relieving suffering and, and, and providing peace of mind uh, during some of the most difficult times many of us will face in life. And now uh, seeing that and understanding the bill, I am a full component uh, for the bill. Uh, in my honor, uh, it is my honor also today to participate in this event and have the opportunity uh, to highlight a dedicated and determined advocate uh, known as Dr. Uh, Omega Silva. Uh, Dr. Silva was a pioneer and leader in so many ways. Uh, she taught and practiced medicine for over 50 years here in the District of Columbia uh, and was a former president of the American Medical Women's Association, as well as the first female president of Howard University Medical Alumni Association. Uh, during the 2018 legislative session in New York, at the age of 81, Dr. Silva traveled via train for over eight hours while fighting three different types of cancers uh, within her body. She came to Albany to share her personal story and support of this most important legislation. Dressed to the T, she addressed the lawmakers and answered questions as a terminal patient, retired physician, and voice for an African-American perspective. She was a trailblazer and brought her passion and vision to the halls of Albany with a fire that is unmatched. Dr. Silva was rallied, would rally take no for an answer. And those who knew her, she would not take no, she would not back down. And helping New York was welcome challenge to her. She gave a heart to it. She would be truly missed. And we honor her efforts and contribution today forever. In her own words, I love my work and my life. But if the time comes, this is what she said, this is a quote from her, my weekly Thursdays chemo treatments are no longer working and my suffering becomes unbearable. I will want medical aid in dying as an option for myself. For the sake of my loved ones, this is what she said. Dr. Sylvia worked hard in DC and enabled her to die peacefully on her own terms, utilizing the medical aid and dying option in Washington, D.C. in May of 2020. Once again, let me say thank you for this opportunity to remind and to remember this remarkable woman. I turn it back to Connie. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have Corinne back. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, I, I'm so sorry I got lost in the ether there. Uh, am I introducing assembly member, the assembly member next? She is, she already spoke to us. Oh, well, I'm sorry I missed it. Thank you so much. Well, uh, great. So Amanda needs no introduction. She joined Compassion and Choices over five years ago because of her own personal loss. Uh, before working to pass end-of-life legislation, she worked at a health insurance company helping people access Medicaid and Medicare. Additionally, Amanda serves as the president of the Board of Education for the Waterville Water City School District, the organizer of the CYO basketball program, the and the head of the cheer portion of the Waterville uh, Youth Football and Cheer Creating a positive life experience for everyone is Amanda's goal in life. And she's certainly done that for me. And I can see where she gets her cheerleader. She's been a cheerleader for our campaign for, for five years. So I'm gonna turn this over to Amanda now, Amanda. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Corinne. And thank you to all of our supporters and storytellers for joining us uh, together for this event today. Each story, as Corinne mentioned you here today, will have a way that you can honor a loved one's memory. We'll be posting those asks as well as how to complete the task in the chat box. So please don't get your pens out and think you have to hurry to jot things down. Do you know what you were doing six years ago today? 
I do, which is why I'm especially thankful to be a part of today's event. I lost my best friend on February 15th, 2015. The love and the life that I was able to experience with Chrissy in just five, much too short years was a treasure that I will forever hold dear to my heart. I can still replay that cold December day as we were packing to take a trip home to celebrate Chrissy's birthday. I could tell that my girlfriend wasn't feeling right. The car ride from our apartment in Fishkill to her parents' home in Clifton Park was full of what ifs, conversations about life and what could possibly be wrong. I was convinced that whatever was bothering Chrissy wasn't that serious. Maybe she needed to have her gallbladder removed or she had kidney stones. Chrissy knew that it was something more. I specifically remember that ride. Chrissy so innocently shared with me her hopes and dreams for the future, and more importantly, her wishes should something go awry. I can tell you with confidence that even in the moments prior to her diagnosis, her wishes for a death that were for what was not for what she experienced. When we arrived at Chrissy's parents, her mom and I convinced her to go to the ER. She didn't want to, she wanted to go shopping. The ER visit quickly turned out from a fast track visit to an inpatient admission. Scans, biopsies, countless amounts of blood work and various tests and quickly our world changed forever. On December 30th, 2011, a year to the date that I met Chrissy, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. The cancer had affected her liver, pancreas and the bile ducts in between those areas. Surgery wasn't an option. The doctor said there was no good option. Chrissy's health was deteriorating rapidly and we wanted something. A Hail Mary of aggressive chemotherapy was the only thing they could offer. So that's what we did. I can still remember sitting in that room, hearing all the information and Chrissy's only concern was about losing her hair. She had prided herself on her cute pigtails under her baseball cap. And the thought of not having her trademark look was devastating. Trips to Memorial Sloan Kettering, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, all ended with the same answer. There was no good option. I remember spending days and nights searching, calling across the country for clinical trials, other cancer treatments, anything that would help prolong Chrissy's life. There was nothing. You see, Chrissy was a fighter, not just a fighter of cancer, but a true fighter. She would have done anything to beat the cancer that had, that had cruelly invaded her body. An almost six foot tall motorcycle riding New York State Correctional Officer that you never saw without a smile was in for the fight of her life. The girl who touched every life that she ever came in contact with was fighting for hers. But much to the doctor's surprise, the chemotherapy that left Chrissy crippled for the majority of her days was working even though the nausea, pain, nerve damage, and endless symptoms were torturing Chrissy. It was working. But after 30 rounds of various chemotherapy cycles, Chrissy's life with cancer was coming to a close. The cancer had began to invade her bones and her brain. She underwent brain surgery and was willing to take on brain radiation, but there was nothing left. In the three years of Chrissy's battle, we were able to experience so many great things. Her closest friends and family never saw her without a full face of makeup and a smile. If you asked Chrissy, she was always okay. If you asked me or Chrissy's parents, she deserved the death that she wanted. In the midst of coming to terms with Chrissy's mortality, we learned of Brittany Menard and discussed the option of moving to Vermont to utilize their medical aid in dying law. But Chrissy didn't wanna leave her family, her friends, and the life that we had spent the last four years creating together. She wanted to be in New York when she passed and she should have had that right. New York provided so many great memories and opportunities for our lives, but this state failed us. New York failed Chrissy at the end of her life. As her parents watched their only child suffer in agony and her family shuffled in and out to say their goodbyes, I couldn't help but feel horrified by the way Chrissy's death was happening. You see, all along Chrissy was an independent person. She never wanted to die at home, unable to communicate with loved ones standing around her. Chrissy wanted to die on her own terms in peace and she deserved that. 
Unfortunately, her death was anything but that. Yes, hospice was there for us, but they could not relieve the suffering that my partner was experiencing in her final days. In the end, administering the ever-increasing doses of morphine to relieve her suffering fell to me and to Chrissy's parents. I was the one who administered the final doses to her and the pain of knowing that the morphine I had to give her was what may have caused her last breath will never diminish. It should have been Chrissy who was able to control the last medication she was to take. That's what she wanted. And I would have been there holding her when she did it. Chrissy deserved better. All New Yorkers do. In honor of Chrissy, my ask for all of you today is to share your support for the Medical Aid and Dying Act on social media. Now, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, Betty Rollin. Betty is a TV correspondent, an accomplished author, and a captivating speaker who we are so lucky to have today. She was a former correspondent for NBC News, an author of seven, bo seven books, including her bestseller, Last Wish, that deals with the suicide of her terminally ill mother. The book was made into a TV movie, which aired in 1992, starring Patty Duke and Maureen Stapleton. Betty, we'd love to have you share your story now. Betty's muted. Betty, you are muted and we're trying to unmute you. So just go look to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a microphone, just click that. It's on the left-hand side of your screen on the bottom where the chat box, uh, where, I, where you found the chat box. I wonder if one of our administrators can unmute Betty. Uh, Betty, do you see the microphone at the bottom of your screen? It's a little picture of a microphone if you hover your Oh, okay. What I shall point we point out that it has a red line in the mic? Yeah, Betty, the the um the mute the um the microphone has a red line through it. If you hover your finger, your cursor over the bottom left. Um, why don't we unmute everyone and then mute everyone again? Um, that's not going to work. Okay. All right, um, Betty, we are going to come back to you once we figure this out. All right, um, I'm going to give you a call and we're going to move on to Dan Diaz. Amanda, can you introduce Dan? Absolutely. Um, Dan, we can't thank you enough for sharing your story and Brittany's story. Um, Dan has been an inspiration to everyone he meets and the husband of the late Brittany Menard. Um, we appreciate you being here and know that you don't need too much of an introduction. Thank you. Um, so good morning. My, my name is Dan Diaz and I am, <clears throat> I am Brittany Menard's husband. Uh, Brittany died on November 1st of 2014. She was only 29 years old. Um, she had been battling a brain tumor that we discovered at the beginning of that year. Brittany endured an eight hour brain surgery and we researched every clinical trial that offered any glimmer of hope, but unfortunately, the tumor continued to growing aggressively and her symptoms were only getting worse. Upon receiving the prognosis of six months to live, Brittany decided that we would move from our home in California to Portland, Oregon, so that she could ensure a gentle dying process if it were to become necessary for her. After uprooting our lives and getting situated in Oregon, Brittany decided to speak up and advocate for medical aid in dying. <clears throat> she did that because she felt that it was a huge injustice um, <clears throat> that anyone else would ever have to leave their home like we did. So on the heels of Valentine's Day this past Sunday, the theme of today's call is about love. And to be clear, Brittany's Brittany advocated very publicly for this option out of love for each and every one of us. 
contemplate this for a second, <clears throat> Brittany's advocacy was not going to benefit her. She had already secured her medication. At that point, she was living her life as best she could for as long as she could. During a time when most people understandably would focus their efforts internally on their family, on their own care, Brittany instead decided to try to make a difference for the rest of humanity, for the rest of us. She did this out of love. She wanted to help any terminally ill individual that might find themselves in her predicament, but not have the ability to move to another state. It simply highlights her caring personality. When Brittany died, there were four states that allowed a terminally ill individual the option of medical aid and dying, Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and Montana. And since then, I think Brittany's story has helped us pass legislation. And we're now up to 10 states. Again, that has occurred out of love. One thing to always keep in mind that Brittany's story is not about death and dying. Brittany's story is about life and living. In the end, she did not die as a victim to cancer. She died in the same manner that she lived her life, with grace, compassion, and love for herself and for her family. Thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. Uh, I'm, working, I'm working hard to help move this legislation forward in New York. Um, and, and I think this is a good reminder that we will be more successful um, with love as our motivation. Um, here are a few more photos of Brittany. So in honor, hopefully the contrast shows okay there. Um, in honor of Brittany, my ask for all of you today is to send an email to your representative. There's a link in the chat box uh, that'll make that very simple. Oh, I love those photos, Dan. A couple I haven't seen before, so that was that was great. Thank you so much for sharing them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank, thank you for all the work that, that you and Brittany have done. I, I don't think we would be this far without you. So, so we really appreciate you. Um, and now we know that um, Miss Betty Rollin is set to speak to us. So Betty, it's you're on. Oh, well, forgive me. I'm 85 and really stupid about every all this, <laughs> the technology. The short version of my story is that I love my mother so I didn't want her to die, but because I loved her, I wanted her to die. My mother was the world's most cheerful person. Her glass was always half full. And when at the age of 74, she got ovarian cancer, she fought the good fight. She endured the most punishing chemotherapy and was rewarded with a good year. And then the cancer came back. There was no more treatment, just some medication for pain relief, which left her sleepy and unable to live in any sense of that word that she considered living. She was miserable. One evening, I'll never forget, she told me that she wanted to die. Many people say that and don't mean it. My mother meant it. I've had a wonderful life, she said in a half whis whisper, but now it's over or it should be. There's nothing left for me now. I'll die slowly. I don't want to die slowly. What's the point of that? I've never liked doing things with no point. When my husband and I came to see her, she was her cheery self for about five minutes. Then she'd go back to that subject. I had a wonderful life, she kept saying, but it's over. Who does it benefit if I die slowly? If it benefited my children, she meant the two of us, I'd be willing, but it doesn't benefit anybody or anything. What's the point? I've got to get out of this. My husband and I started to realize she meant it. We also came to realize she thought we would somehow be able to help her. This was 1983. There was 
no law that would allow a doctor to help her. But my husband was a mathematician. I was a journalist. We knew how to do research. We found a way. Really working with us, my mother found a way. She had managed to get barbiturates from her doctor, something that would be impossible to do today. Almost immediately, when my mother felt confident that she would be able to die, we noticed a change in her. She became herself again. For one thing, she started bossing me around in the way she used to. I bought this ridiculous hat in Bloomingdale's. It's in the closet. Make sure you return it, okay? Yes, mother. Her sister visited her and noticed the change. She thought my mother was getting well. She couldn't understand it. Of course, we said nothing. I realized later that the change in my mother was all about her feeling in control. She was no longer afraid of a lengthy, horrible death. Shortly after that visit, my mother said to us, I think Monday would be a good day. Monday. Monday was three days away. So Monday came. She had put on some makeup and asked for one of the photo albums of my childhood. She smiled at us and began to talk about the pictures. This is Betty in our backyard, she said to my husband, who found himself unable to speak. At some point, she stopped talking. The photo album slipped out of her hands. She went to sleep and she didn't wake up. 38 years later, three years ago, a colonoscopy missed my husband's colon cancer and he learned he was in stage four of that disease. Like my mother, he got chemotherapy, not nearly as punishing as my mother's, and we were grateful for that. But soon the cancer broke through and so the treatment stopped and he was told he now had two years to live. Although aid in dying was now legal in nine states plus Washington DC, we both were deeply aware that New York where we lived was not one of those states. Of course, there's hospice now. And my husband was such a good sport about the pain. And hospice get, gave us, we, they were wonderful and came immediately and gave and provided much better pain control than we certainly could have had. But we also learn that pain is often unpredictable and hospice is not an around the clock nursing service, which we suddenly needed and got. We hired private duty nurses. We were lucky we could afford it. They were very expensive. Still, I will always remember my husband screaming, I want to die, I want to die now. He died in November and here is our wedding photo with my mother. Higher. A little bit higher, yeah, a little bit higher. There you go. Move it over so you can see his face the other way. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Betty, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna put uh, the link to Betty's book in the chat box and turn it back over to Amanda. Thank you. In honor of, of Betty's mother and her husband, we're asking today that you call Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins and ask her to allow this bill to come to the floor this year. Next, I would like to turn it over to Miss Stacy Gibson. Stacy was amongst one of the first advocates that I have ever met in this movement and her tireless advocacy for the last six years cannot be understated. I don't know that I would 
be here if it weren't for Stacy. So Stacy, it's it's my honor and pleasure to allow you the opportunity um, to share Sid's story and remember him on his birthday today. Oh, Stacy, you've got to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Corinne, for the opportunity to honor my husband, Sidney Joseph Gibson. And as Amanda said, today would have been his 75th birthday. So it is particularly uh, meaningful. And this is Sid uh, with my granddaughter, Dana. Um, Sid died at the age of 68 on uh, May 5th, 2014. And although it's going on nearly seven years, it seems like only yesterday we were just sitting in our kitchen, eating a breakfast and just laughing. Sid was my soulmate. He was my best friend. Um, I met him on April 7th, and I think I fell in love with him the moment I met him, and I'm still in love with him to this day. Um, Sid wasn't perfect, nor am I, but somehow we were just perfect together. Uh, what's still so hard today is missing the one person in my life who believed in me more than anyone ever has. He was always there to show me the possibilities that were out there and made sure that I achieved them. And I did the same for him. To this day, every day, I wake up and I go to sleep just missing my very best friend. Sid had been ill for eight years with a progressive neurological disease that had similar effects as ALS. Over the course of his illness, he lost what to most of us would have seemed like a great deal. His ability to walk, to swallow, to maintain balance and control of his bladder and bowel. Sid knew what he wanted to say, but couldn't get the words out. He felt overwhelmed and confused all the time, especially when there was the slightest increase in activity. The list of effects from his terminal illness just go on and on. Despite his ailments, Sid had a very clear focus on what he wanted at the end, a compassionate way to end his suffering. He was always a supporter of medical aid and dying and a supporter of everyone's right to choose both how they should live and how they wanted to die. Six months before Sid passed, he had contacted Final Exit Network and was assigned an exit counselor to assist him in ending his life. A part of his application to final exit read, and I quote, I understand my condition will progress and result in complete deterioration of all my abilities, physical, mental, cognitive. There is no medication, surgery, exercise, nutrition that will make me whole and healthy again. My path has been predetermined. I want to end my life because I believe in the dignity of one's quality of life and not in one's quantity. I do not want to take the chance of crossing over that invisible line when choice will no longer be an option available to me. It is critical that I end my life before I become a burden to those who love me. I have been extremely fortunate to participate in extraordinary relationships throughout my life and these continue to participate to, and these continue in these difficult end of life decisions. It is important that my beautiful grandchildren, Will and Dana, understand the strength of the human spirit and how much someone can accomplish if they try hard and never give up. So I wish to die while they still have a strong pop-up as a lasting image, end of quote. Those are Sid's words that illustrate so beautifully who he was, what was important to him and what he wanted at the end of his life. This was written January 9th, 2014. Just four short weeks later, Sid went into hospice care in our home. Sid was never able to avail himself of the services of final exit as he progressed downward very quickly after that and was physically unable to end his life. He died three months later by electing to voluntarily stop eating and drinking under the care of hospice. The compassionate death that Sid so badly longed for was denied to him, and instead he had a terrible end that no one should have to experience. My beautiful memories of the life that Sid and I had together are often interrupted by his final mo moments struggling with terminal agitation, restlessness, and pure suffering. He deserved better. He deserved the option of medical aid and dying. Simply having the access to this option would have given Sid the peace and dignity at the end that reflected how he lived his life. I promised my best friend Sid that I would work on medical aid and dying until it was passed, no matter how long it takes. As Amanda indicated, she and I were together in 2015 and I will be on this journey until we are successful. My ask, 
is that all of you who are here today honor Sid and Chrissy by calling Assembly Speaker Carl Heastie and ask him to allow the medical aid and dying bill to advance in 2021. Please make sure your voices are heard loudly and that they're heard very often. We must pass this bill this year. Our lives and the lives of our loved ones depend on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy. That was beautiful. We appreciate you sharing Sid and yourself with us, and I know he would be so proud of you. Okay. Now I'll turn it over to Jan Green. Jan has made it her mission in the past few years of our campaign to do whatever it takes to ensure Harry's death is remembered and honored. Jan? Jan, we've got to unmute. That was your camera. <laughs> the next button over. Nope. Jan, it's a little microphone with a red, uh, it's red with a little line through it. There you go. Okay, thank you. I thought I was on this a picture. Harry, can you see it? Oh, there. Harry was my partner for 26 years and I found out he had brain cancer. He went through all possible treatments and he beat cancer back for a time. Harry loved life. He had a passion for hunting, fishing, and camping. If you could see this house, we have a lot of uh, animals in our house and reminds me of Harry. While in treatment, he continued to do the things he loved. But in February of 2016, he fell. Tests revealed bone cancer and we were relieved and he realized he now faced two kinds of cancer. At this point, he asked me one thing that's very hard for me to say, he asked me to shoot him. Of course I would not, but the fact that he asked me, told me all I needed to know about his suffering and the lengths he would be willing to go through to end his pain. We went to his primary doctor who told Harry he would try to make him as comfortable as possible. And hospice came into our home to provide support for me and pain management for Harry. And that was not enough. His pain often broke through and became unbearable and could do nothing to ease his suffering. He kept asking me, please help me. It was agonizing to watch me and I know suffered so much. Harry stopped eating. It took five weeks. At the last two days, he stopped breathing, started breathing, stopped breathing, started breathing. It was very difficult to see the person that you love go through something like that when you, you need an option in the New York State. One of my sleepless nights, I read about the work of Compassion and Choices. They believe, as I do, that those who are terminally ill should have legal options to help them end their lives without prolonged suffering. Everyone should have an option. And thank you so much. In honor of Harry, I'm asking for all of you today to call those who represent you in assembly and the Senate. If you're unsure, there are links at the chat box to identify who the people are. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jan. I know how horrible it is to relive those final moments. We appreciate you. Our next speaker today is Scott Baracco. Scott has been on the front lines of our campaign, sharing the powerful images of his late girlfriend, Kathy. His story is an impactful and an important one. Scott, we're happy to have you today. Hi, can you hear me all right? Okay. I'm here today because I lost my love, Kathy Quinn, almost seven years ago to tongue cancer. Uh, Kathy was uh, courageous, trying to beat it, do everything that she could to live so much like all our other uh, stories have, have gone through. Knowing she was going to die soon made it even worse knowing that she was also losing her autonomy. The emotional pain she suffered may have been more devastating than the physical pain. There were plenty of both and it was all unnecessary. We both became advocates for medical aid and dying the moment we learned of it. And, and for us, that happened when she came to in her hospital room 
after purposely overdosing with alcohol and pain meds. In the absence of medical aid in dying, that was her attempt to die peacefully on her terms in her own home. And as much as Kathy researched how to do it, and as much as I prepared myself and dreaded knowing I would likely find her someday just gone, she didn't do it right. <clears throat> the doctor said she was lucky not to come back from it without brain damage. It was all very heartbreaking. She wound up passing away the next month, unable to go on her terms, and I've been advocating for it ever since. But today, I just wanted to share a, a quick story of our first Valentine's together. We've, we've been dating about a month and a half. We're both celebrating, looking forward to celebrating that special night with someone who we were falling in love with. Uh, Kathy was beautiful and feeling healthy in those days. Um, we were both optimistic. And um, when the topic came up, I'm not the kind of guy that if you ask where you want to go to dinner, I, I, I would always say, I don't care where you want to go. But Kathy was not like that. She was a planner. She always had a plan. And for her, the plan was just important as the rewarding event, uh, as rewarding as the event might be. For our big date, she wanted to try a new restaurant, trendy, rest, trendy restaurant downtown. And of course, it was a great idea. She had all kinds of good ideas. Me, I was more clueless, but I was enthusiastic. Um, she made the reservations. We got all dressed up. We had a beautiful romantic dinner at this at this cozy restaurant. And it, at the end of the night, um, when we were getting ready to leave, I, I tucked my uh, credit card into the bill uh, where the bill was and went off to the bathroom. And when I came back, she handed me back my credit card and apologized to me. She was embarrassed that the bill was so high and didn't want me to fork out that much money on our big date. And um, I tried to resist, but it was too late. She already paid the bill. It, she said that I was welcome to leave a really good tip, but, but that was the end of that. That was the end of that. I couldn't do anything else about it. Um, uh, and and it was more pricey than most of our days, but you know that was the last thing on my mind. I I had other romantic ideas that I was thinking about. Um, but what a stellar move by Kathy uh, to show such consideration for me in the moment. <clears throat> she was a bored problem solver, and she fed off of it. She would take action, and she was generous in every way. Kathy found obstacles like a bigger than expected dinner check as a challenge, and she was always up to it. Bad news might tick her off, no doubt, but it never deflated her. It inspired her to make the most of the moment. That's what she always did. It's who she was, and it's how she dealt with the cancer, too. Kathy desperately wanted to exercise those same innate traits at the very end of her life that she so wonderfully used all through it. Imagine replacing the cruel helplessness she felt with the satisfaction she could have had in those final weeks if she had the resources to plan her own way to say goodbye, to die in peace on her own, in her own home. That's why I believe medical aid in dying is truly an act of love. <clears throat> in honor Kathy, my ask for all of you today is to call health committee member, assembly member, Mikael Solage and ask for her support in passing this law in 2021. Uh, Kathy deserved better, I think we all do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, for so beautifully illustrating why the option of medical aid in dying is needed for everyone that's terminally ill and not just one in five Americans. Your voice is so important. Our next speaker today is Flory Burke. Flory's late partner, Barbara Hammer, was a feminist filmmaker and pioneer of queer cinema who spent her final months advocating for medical aid and dying as an option. Flory? Hi. This is not easy. It's not easy for terminally ill people to advocate for a dignified death for themselves. And it's not easy for their loved ones to keep returning to those last months, weeks, days and minutes, but we do it. I do it in honor and memory of my beloved Barbara Hammer, my life partner of 31 years. She died in March of 2019. She deserved a better death, one on her terms without suffering. Barbara had ovarian cancer for 12 years. She endured multiple surgeries, radiation, clinical trials, 
and 100 chemotherapy treatments. This was not someone who wanted to die. She wanted to live, live fully until she couldn't. She never gave up on anything, work, art, cancer treatments, me, friends, the sanctity of life. She leaves a legacy of 90 films and countless artworks. Let her also leave a legacy of helping to get medical aid and dying past. Barbara used her platform to advocate, even though she was desperately ill during her last six months of life. She gave a talk at the Whitney Museum on the art of dying. She did an interview for the New Yorker. She made a video for Compassion and Choices. She didn't always feel up to doing these things, but she felt it was so important. And a few weeks before her death, she met with Senator Hoyleman, who came to our apartment. She said she knew it was too late for her, but she asked him to pass the act for others. He told her he would work as hard as he could to do so. Barbara taught those around her that death was a part of life. She wasn't afraid of dying, but she was afraid of suffering. And even though she was surrounded by love, she still suffered. She suffered because New York state law required her to. Please do the right thing this year. Help pass the Medical Aid and Dying Act. I ask all of you to call assembly member Richard Gottlieb, the chair of the health committee. Tell him that we need the legislators to lead, to lead with compassion so that others with terminal disease can carefully be in charge of their own passing. Please do not allow more suffering. I don't want anyone to have to hear the last words that I heard from Barbara as she died at home with me. She said, take me away, take me away. She was suffering. We need to stop this. Thank you. Oh, what a lovely photo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flori. I know um, Barbara's proud of you today, taking the reins on stage and sharing her story the way that she always did. Thank well, you. When I think of love and compassion, our next storyteller is the epitome of just that. Lindsay Wright, we thank you for sharing Yusuf's journey with us. You're up next. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda and Corinne. You know, today's theme about medical aid and dying as an act of love and compassion really touches me so, so deeply in here. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, especially this year and this moment during this terrible pandemic when so many families just here in New York have lost loved ones. We should, I think about, we should all be talking about end of life, about how we and our loved ones want to die. And yet so often we don't. My husband, Yusuf Cohen, and here's a photo of him. Um, we moved to New York um, more than 30 years ago, like so many transplants to New York City. We, you know, we built a rich life together filled with connections and meaning and love. And he taught thousands of students at NYU, studied Buddhism, had a striped sock fetish. <laughs> um, but in 2016, at 68, he died of mesothelioma. It's a rare and incurable cancer of the lungs, but he didn't die here in New York. He actually died on the other coast in Portland, Oregon, where Dan and Brittany had moved as well. You know, like so many others that we've heard about today, like Amanda's Chrissy and Scott's Kathy, Yusuf did everything he could to extend his life chemo, radiation, clinical trials, experimental medications. But one day in March, his physician told us what we all hoped to never hear. There was nothing else they could do. So we came home from that doctor's visit, said goodbye to our friends as we packed our things. And two days later, we were in a furnished apartment in Portland that we had sublet only weeks earlier. We had moved 
3,000 miles across the country so that he could take advantage of Oregon's Death with Dignity Act because New York didn't offer that option. New York still doesn't offer that option. We moved there so that he could get medication to end his life how and when he wanted. And he had been clear for many years about how he wanted to die, that he didn't want to suffer. And I had made a promise to help him. But, you know, moving to Oregon was the hardest, most gut-wrenching thing I've ever done in my life. I don't know how or where I found the strength to do that. For us, for him to leave everyone behind the warmth of our home, our beloved New York City, to die far away from all of this. It was, it was an act of love. I can't call it anything else, of deep compassion. On my part, on my family's part, on our friend's part, also on his part to make sure he could die with dignity wherever that would take us. It was only possible because of love. Just weeks before he died in a video for Compassion and Choices, Yusuf said, I'm going to die anyhow. And so it's about choosing how you, how we, how I want to die. And this seems to me a much more humane way of dying. That humane way of dying is medical aid and dying. All New Yorkers deserve this option right here in New York State now more than ever. No one should have to move across the country just because they want to die on their own terms. New Yorkers, we know, New Yorkers want to die at home, surrounded by people they love and who love them. So let's help them do that. Let's give them medical aid in dying out of love and compassion. So in honor of Yusuf, I ask all of you today to call Health Committee member, Senator Todd Kaminsky, and ask for his support in passing medical aid and dying in 2021. And if all of us do each of these acts that we've all asked for today, will have a big impact on passing this legislation this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Just another glimpse why we need this option in New York and not just in other states. Our next speaker has helped pave the way for support from the League of Women Voters, which has really taken our campaign to another level. We're so thankful to have, our, um, to have her voice. Barb, it's your turn to share Bob's story. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about the League, although Bob was very supportive of all my activities in the League. Um, but it's now been eight years since my husband Bob died, and I think I can maybe show a pic one picture of him. Um, and the agony of the last 14 months of his life is still fresh in my mind. Bob and I fell in love when we were in college, and we married when he graduated in 1957. He was a loving, supportive husband, father, grandfather. We had four children, all of them boys, and spent lots of time as a family out of doors, camping, canoeing, hiking, cross-country skiing. And we spent lots of quiet time reading to our children and sharing books and ideas. Bob was a meteorologist because he loved statistics, whether they were about the weather or baseball players. And he loved reading, fishing, hunting, and just walking in the woods. Unfortunately, Bob was stricken with glioblastoma multiforma, a brain cancer, toward the end of 2010. It was already dark and he hadn't returned from the woods where he was walking with his dog, Zena. I found him chilled and on the ground with Zena nearby, but I couldn't get him up. It took the volunteer fire department and EMTs to get him through the woods to the ambulance. After several days of testing, he had an MRI that we thought was going to rule out any brain tumor. Wrong. Instead, I drove him to the neurosurgery unit at Albany Med, and right after Thanksgiving, they removed as much of the tumor as could be removed. 
Once the surgery confirmed the diagnosis, we knew that the statistics showed he only had 14 months to live. He recovered from the surgery, had six weeks of daily radiation treatments, took oral chemo pills, but grew progressively weaker and less able to walk and could only read a few sentences at a time. By May of 2011, Bob was ready to die. He said that he was glad that he'd had time to put his affairs in order, but he could no longer do any of the things he liked to do, and he wanted out. To be clear, Bob wasn't suicidal. He wanted to live, but his brain cancer chose to end his life. All he was asking for was assistance in ending his suffering when he couldn't take it anymore. He asked me to get his pistol, pistol so he could shoot himself. As a responsible gun owner with a pistol permit, his guns were in a locked gun cabinet up a flight of stairs he could no longer climb. I didn't, couldn't do it. I loved him. I couldn't watch him do that. I told him that everyone would know that I had helped him, that I didn't want to go to jail for helping him. He didn't want me to go to jail either. We would cry together because the situation was so impossible. I still feel guilty that I didn't help him escape his misery. Bob died January 18th, 2012. We'd been together for 55 years. He was my best friend, my lover, the person I spent more time with than anyone else in my life. I vowed to myself that I didn't want anyone else I loved to suffer like that. And I don't want to suffer that way either. In honor of Bob, my ask for you, all of you today is to call health Com committee member Assemblyman Charles Barron and ask for his support in passing medical aid in dying in 2021. And his phone number is 718-257-5824. So um, in honor of Bob, please do that. Thank you so much, Bob. Barb, mm -hmm. not Bob. Thank you so much to Bob and to Barb. The stories of those who suffer at the end of their life, including Bob, without options are heartbreaking. We appreciate you continuing to share. Our next speaker, Ray Smith, would like to share about his wife. Ray? All right. Perfect, Ray. Okay. Uh, First, this, I can't see where I am. Let me see where I am. <laughs> I can't see what you're saying and I need to see what you're saying. Do you see that? Oh, here we go. This right. is a picture of our household. It's Anne and me and our two Australian cattle dogs, Anzac and Diggy. Ray, move the picture up just a little bit. <clears throat> there they are. Okay. We have two grown children who live away, but this was our household for about 10 years. Uh, and the, three years ago, Ann got a diagnosis of a neurodegenerative disease for which there was no treatment and no cure and which ultimately was fatal, would be fatal. It left your mind intact, but it, uh, it slowly robbed you of the ability to use your muscles. And um, it, it was just crippling to watch Anne slowly deteriorate. Otherwise she was in great health. She had, um, took no medications, had no illnesses, no ailments of any sort, none that usually occur to people at our age of 87. Uh, she worked outside with Anzac and Diggy every day and we took hikes. 
she could have lived into her hundreds and very likely would have. But most of those years, she would have been in completely dependent on other people for absolutely everything. She didn't want any part of that. Uh, finally, she could only use about one finger on one hand. Her right foot and leg didn't work right. And when she ran out of, out of the ability to do enough of the things that were really important to her, she just, and she had the only option was to VSED, voluntarily stop eating and drinking. We were lucky because her GP for the two years before this had been uh, and still is a medical director of our local hospice. And we had hospice care. We had very good 24 seven caregivers, but I can tell you that process as others have related is brutally barbaric. And no matter what you do, no matter how much morphine, Haldol, lorazepam, whatever, you're never pain free and you never get totally comfortable. So here's the picture again. Can you see it, Amanda? Yes, we can. Okay. Within a period of 16 months, every one of those people in that picture is dead, except for me. The only two people who had a comfortable death were Anzac and Diggy, because unlike human beings, we let dogs go easily. That's why we need to pass medical aid in dying in New York State so that those who qualify can get the same relief. In honor of Ann, my ask for all of you is to call health committee member, assembly member, Bishot Hermelin, and ask for her support in passing medical aid in dying in 2021. We need it right now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ray. We really appreciate you joining us today and, and sharing the story of Anne. Thank you for everyone who stuck with us. Um, we've now arrived at our last speaker, however, certainly not least. Kira Topaski joined us last year and has been a relentless with lawmakers ever since. Only Kira's words can justify her story. Kira? Okay, I hope you can hear me now, thank you. Uh, I appreciate so much you waiting to the very end to listen to me and for being here. I've heard some very inspirational stories again from all of those uh, who are on this call. And this is about love. This is about my crazy nut of a husband here who, um, that was when they had to break the ice on Lake George so he could do the polar bear swim on January 1st. And that was the year before he died. Um, my husband, John, was um, a college professor, a Navy veteran. The fact that he wrote newspaper columns and uh, just loved life. He played in the World Series of Poker. And, you know, he was a true humanitarian who loved people. He always rooted for the underdog and he had a lot of fun. He made me laugh every day. So in his honor, um, in the spirit of love that with with all, I, uh, with all my heart that I can please emphasize that sometimes uh, when you're in these final stages of a cancer, he had stage four pancreatic cancer, uh, that drugs just don't do it for people. There are people on the planet who just don't react well to pain medication. And that was my husband's story. Um, after his diagnosis, immediately we went into chemotherapy, which led to five rounds of, of hospital stays for constipation, which the bowels uh, were bound by the drugs. Uh, he hallucinated so violently on the drugs, he tried to rip his IVs out of his arms. It required a team of 10 nurses to hold him down on the bed. And I have visions of chest tubes, draining fluid, and uh, really horrible invasion things, and not being able to feed him for months, not being able to help him sleep, but he was in too much pain to move. There were just terrible, terrible things I witnessed. And at the very end, when we finally went into the hospital, we'd been in hospice, they couldn't manage his pain. We had to go back down to the ICU and I had to hold his hand while he drowned, basically suffocated from all the fluid buildup in his lungs over a period of five days. 
Now, I can tell you that is that is not in the spirit of love, and we should be ashamed of ourselves as a society. We should make this law into uh, every single state as soon as possible. And I, my ask today, after talking with my husband at great length, he was, you know, a Roman Catholic. He really believed in a loving God. He wanted to be delivered into this loving God's hands in his own time. Frequently during these hospital bouts, he would say to me, I've had enough. I have to have this stuff. I can't go on like this. Please give me a pill. Let's go to Vermont. <laughs> he knew right over the border we could, we could have had some relief, but he was eligible right off of the bat from getting his diagnosis and nothing was available to him except the most painful, hideous death that I could imagine anyone witnessing. So in his honor, please ask everyone, please call everyone, please share your story with your next door neighbor and have them call. I, my ask is global. I want all of us to have the right to die on our own terms, in our own way, at our, at our request. That's what I want for myself. So I ask all of you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kira. Whew, this last hour has been breathtaking, heartbreaking, and yet so inspiring. I'm so thankful to each and every one of you on this call, whether you listened the past hour or you shared your story. Our speakers who've had their courage to share their journeys with us, um, we just, we can't thank you enough. So today, um, and always, for Chrissy, for Betty's mom and husband, for Brittany, for Sid, for Kathy, for Barbara, Yusuf, Bob, and John, and for all the storytellers and advocates that we've lost in the past five years in this campaign, um, please take action today. Have your friends take some sort of action. It has been far too long that New Yorkers have lived without the option of medical aid and dying, and the time is now to stop the suffering. Corinne? Amanda, thank you so much for conceiving of and moderating this event today. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, and really, this journey would be uh, so much less rich without you alongside us. Um, I've shown so many resources and phone numbers in the chat. We picked out some of the, the toughest um, legislative targets for you to make phone calls to today. If you weren't able to jot down some of those numbers, we'll share them with you after this call. Um, in honor of John, uh, Kira's husband, please um, you know, make a phone call to Senator Ryan. His number is there in the chat and all of the others that, uh, that I posted there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sticking with us to the end. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of your faces again real soon, hopefully in person maybe. <laughs> Stay safe, take care. Thank you. Bye -bye.